Chapter fourteen of the Dawn of Medieval Europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by J. H. B. Masterman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Iconoclastic Emperors. The history of the empire in the eighth century turns almost entirely around the iconoclastic controversy after the great siege of constantinople that opened the reign of leo the third the saracens did not seriously menace the heart of the empire though they continued their attacks on outlying provinces nor again did the emperors make any effective attempt to reassert their authority in italy but internally the empire was taking the form that it was destined to retain for centuries in language and customs it was losing its roman character and becoming more definitely greek already the law books of justinian were unintelligible to the people and a greek handbook of law the ecloga was drawn up under the emperor's instructions while the european territories of the emperor were becoming more greek the lands of asia minor were losing their greek population and passing into the hands of men of eastern race from syria armenia and persia one beneficial result of the slavonic settlements in the balkan district was the disappearance of serfdom in the empire the place of the serf being taken by free tenants or village communes in the disturbed conditions of the time it is not strange that literature and art should have decayed and various foolish superstitions grown up theology had filled the east with controversy but religion was at a low ebb and the moral standard of the clergy was thoroughly unsatisfactory the task that lay before a reforming emperor was sufficiently discouraging but no reform could begin till the great struggle with the moslems the impending outbreak of which had called leo to the throne was over within five months of the accession of the new emperor seven eighteen the saracen commander moslema with eighty thousand men had crossed the hellespont and began to blockade the city with a ditch and rampart on the first of september suleiman arrived with a fleet of eighteen hundred warships in the defence of the city greek fire plays a leading part this greek or marine fire the exact composition of which is not known was a kind of sticky or viscid substance of a highly inflammable nature that was poured from cauldrons or vomited from tubes on to the ships or engines of the enemy it is said to have been first used in the siege of constantinople of six seventy three and the following years leo's first success was the burning of twenty transports with this greek fire an exploit that filled the enemy with fear of this deadly weapon of defence in the long and severe winter that followed the besiegers suffered great hardships but in the spring fresh reinforcements arrived ill fortune dogged the saracen cause a large number of egyptian christians who were serving in the moslem fleet deserted to the enemy and emboldened by this leo made another attack on the ships some of which he destroyed and threw the rest into confusion then a saracen army that was blockading the asiatic shores of the bosphorus was surprised and routed by a body of roman soldiers famine also began to threaten the besieging army and finally in the summer of seven eighteen a bulgarian army from the north fell upon the saracens and inflicted severe losses on them on the fifteenth of august the siege was raised and the moslem retreat began the army succeeded in reaching syria but the fleet was scattered by a tempest and only five vessels arrived home of all the great armada that was to open the gate of europe to the moslems arab records put the loss on the saracen side at not less than a hundred and fifty thousand men the defence of constantinople by leo deserves to rank with the battle fought by charles martel fourteen years later they represent the two supreme attempts made by the omayyad dynasty to break through the great barriers that guarded christendom from moslem attack 
from this time the tide of battle turned and the rest of the century saw the gradual decline of saracen rule both in the east and in the west in 750 the last caliph of the omeyad dynasty was slain and damascus fell into the hands of the new dynasty of the abbasides only in spain did the omeyad party retain power and the moslems of the west were henceforth cut off from all connection with those of the east the deliverance of constantinople was immediately followed by the outbreak of the iconoclastic controversy the great contest which was destined to cause the final severance between eastern and western europe and so prepare the way for the establishment of a western empire was the outcome of an edict issued by leo in seven twenty six ordering the removal of pictures and images from the churches it is often said that leo was moved to this step by the jeers of the moslems who charged the christians with idolatry but he was probably influenced quite as much by the growth of childish superstitions connected with the pictures and coloured figures that adorned the churches a little while before this time a sect had arisen in asia minor calling themselves paulicians or followers of st paul one of whose distinctive tenets was the belief in the evil of matter and therefore the repudiation of symbols there is probably some direct connection between these paulicians and the albigenses and waldenses of later times and it is not improbable that they influenced the isaurian emperors in their religious policy to some extent the iconoclastic edict was the outcome of the theological controversy that had played so large a part in byzantine history in the previous century the monophysites whom the emperors of the seventh century frequently supported held the view that our lord's human nature was absorbed and lost in the divine and it seemed to follow from this that any attempt to represent the saviour in human form was to be discouraged as bringing into prominence that human side of his being that was only an illusion for the same reason image worshippers claimed to be defenders of the doctrine of the true humanity of christ but as the controversy proceeded it broadened out into a general attack by the rationalistic spirit on the ecclesiastical tendencies of the time a kind of eighth century lutheranism mariolatry the worship of saints and the adoration of relics were included in the imperial condemnation under constantine the fifth and monasticism itself was attacked by his reforming zeal the chief support of the imperial policy came from the army which was recruited to a considerable extent from the same district in the highlands of asia from which the isaurian emperors derived their name its chief opponents were the monks who were the leaders of missionary work their ground of opposition may be summarized in a saying of gregory the great pictures are the lesson books of the unlearned undoubtedly the great numbers of unlearned people who had recently passed over from heathenism to christianity tended to carry image worship to what men on both sides admitted was excessive and superstitious lengths but on the other hand it was urged that without the help provided by these outward symbols many of them would find the new faith impossible to understand but while many thoughtful men regarded the imperial edict as an attempt to solve by mere force a question that needed much more delicate handling the populace raged against the destruction of images to which the greatest veneration was attached riots broke out even in constantinople itself and in italy it was impossible to enforce the edict at all germanus patriarch of constantinople resigned rather than assent to the imperial policy which involved a claim to interfere in ecclesiastical questions to which he would not submit leo appointed a new patriarch favourable to his policy but pope gregory refused to recognize him and most of the churchmen of the empire repudiated his authority an unsuccessful attempt was even made to set up a rival emperor on leo's death in seven forty one 
he was succeeded by his son constantine 740 to 775 who received the opprobrious nickname of copronymus constantine was as resolute an iconoclast as his father and much more uncompromising in the measures he took to enforce the edicts after putting down with considerable difficulty a rebellion of his brother-in-law artavastos he had to face an even more pressing peril in a devastating plague that swept through the empire and practically depopulated constantinople constantine imported fresh families from greece to fill the almost empty city leaving slavs from the north to fill the vacant lands in greece it was from this time that constantinople can be regarded as greek rather than roman though it still jealously kept the roman name constantine succeeded in stamping out all public disobedience to his father's edicts but he really only drove the custom of image worship into secrecy in 753 he called a great council of 338 bishops which condemned all representations of our lord and all worship of images of saints when the leaders of the church declined to accept the decisions of the council constantine practically declared war on the monastic system and demolished a considerable number of monasteries on the frontiers he defended the empire efficiently frequently driving back saracens in the east and subduing slavs in the north he waged three successful wars with the bulgarians and developed the internal resources of the empire after a reign of thirty-five years constantine died and was succeeded by his son leo the fourth seven seventy five to seven eighty the khazar as he was called after the tribe to which his mother belonged in seven sixty eight he had married an athenian lady irene by whom he had one son constantine in seven eighty leo died having in his short reign shown his determination to maintain his father's policy but the empress who now became mistress of the empire as regent for her son was secretly in favour of image worship and at once set herself to undo the policy of the isaurian house as a first step to this end the five half-brothers of the late emperor were compelled to take holy orders in order to be incapacitated from reigning when three years later the patriarch paul resigned she determined to advance her own secretary tarasius to the vacant office he agreed on condition that a council should meet to settle the controversy after some delay due to the opposition of the army some regiments of which had to be sent away from the capital the council met in september seven eighty seven at nicaea the issue of its deliberations was never in doubt and the final decree orders images to be set up in church for worship proscunesis but not for the adoration latria that belongs only to god forasmuch as the honour paid to an image passeth on to the original and he who adoreth an image doth in it adore the person of him who it doth represent it is worth remembering that the images here referred to are paintings or mosaics on a flat surface and statues are still not used in the greek church but scarcely had this great success for irene's policy been secured before she found herself in a contest for power with her own son an unsuccessful attack on southern italy due to a rupture of friendly relations with the frankish king charles aroused discontent with irene's rule and constantine now grown to man's estate attempted to throw off his mother's yoke the plot was discovered and constantine was whipped and confined to his room like a schoolboy irene then demanded from the soldiers a new oath in which they pledged themselves not to accept her son as their ruler while she lived this led to a revolt of the army already indignant at the empress's policy and constantine was liberated and irene imprisoned in her palace but in seven ninety two constantine now apparently secure on his throne liberated his mother just before this he had as a punishment for a real or supposed conspiracy blinded one of his uncles and split the tongues of the others for four years irene remained to all outward appearance on friendly terms with her son 
but in 795 he laid himself open to attack by repudiating his wife Maria, to whom he had been married against his will after a project for a marriage with a daughter of Charles the Great had fallen through, and marrying Theodote, one of the maids of honour. This step alienated the church leaders of the empire and probably helped Irene to form a party. In 797, Constantine was attacked by some soldiers, fled to Asia, was brought back by some treacherous friends, and was finally blinded by his mother's orders in the very room in the palace in which he had been born. He lingered on for many years in blindness and misery. Irene was now sole ruler of the empire, but the real power was in the hands of two rival eunuchs of the palace, Storachios and Aetius, who successfully gained the patronage of their mistress. The four years of Irene's supremacy are marked in history by the coronation of Charles as emperor in the West, an event probably not unconnected with the fact that the empire had now passed under the monstrous regiment of women. In 802 the magnates of the empire determined to bring this condition of things to an end, and chose one of their number, Nicephorus, whom they proceeded to proclaim as emperor. Irene fell, undefended and unregretted, and was sent to end her life at Lesbos, where she died a year later. Her crimes did not prevent her memory from being held in reverence as the restorer of image worship. The history of the Byzantine Empire in the ninth century need not be told in much detail, as it has little direct bearing on the general course of European affairs. Nicephorus, 802 to 811, the new emperor, inherited a war with the caliph, the celebrated Harun al Rashid, and with the new emperor of the West, Charles the Great. Both these he brought to an end, the first at the cost of a tribute of thirty thousand solidi, the second without any cession of territory or money. But he and his son were killed in 811 in an expedition against the Bulgarians, and a series of emperors successively seized the throne, none of them holding it long, till Michael the Amorian, a turbulent soldier, was raised to power in 820. His reign is chiefly notable for the loss of Sicily and Crete, which fell into the hands of the Moslems. His son Theophilus, who succeeded on his death in 829, resumed the iconoclastic policy of the Isaurians. But again, the work of suppressing image worship was undone by a woman's influence. Theophilus died in 842, leaving his wife Theodora as regent for their little son Michael. Theodora was secretly a strong partisan of the image worshipping party and no sooner was she in office than a fresh reaction began and image worship was again restored when michael grew up he banished his mother and ruled with the advice of his uncle bardas a depraved and drunken man whose influence over the young emperor was wholly bad however in eight sixty six he was slain by the emperor's orders and michael then chose as his colleague an able young officer basil the macedonian who repaid his patron by murdering him a year later and so becoming sole emperor in the east the macedonian dynasty thus inaugurated ruled the byzantine empire for two hundred years on the whole with ability and success under basil the empire reconquered southern italy from the saracens and carried successful raids into syria and mesopotamia he was succeeded by his son leo 886 to 912 who was a student and dabbler in literature and earned the name of the wise because he was supposed to be learned in curious arts it was fortunate for the empire that the decreasing power of the caliphs and the confusion of western europe ensured immunity from external attack and even enabled the imperial frontiers to be extended in southern italy and in the east Leo's son Constantine, Porphyrogenitus, as he was called, because he was the first emperor for a considerable time who had been born during his father's reign, carried on his father's habit of interest in literature, while the actual work of government was left to the great officials of state. Among the most important events of the period were the missionary labors of two brothers, Cyril and Methodius, who reduced the language of the Balkan Slavs to writing and translated the Bible into it. 
about the middle of the ninth century the bulgarian king boris and the servian king radislav were baptized and christianity was formally adopted as the religion of both peoples so we leave the byzantine empire at peace developing its internal resources and commerce free at last from theological controversies and tending more and more to a life of its own outside the main stream of european progress End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the dawn of medieval europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by j h b masterman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami charles the great and the lombard kingdom the accession of charles eldest son of pippin brings on the scene the central figure of the period covered by this volume for the period might not inaccurately be described as the period of the rise and fall of frankish supremacy in europe from the first appearance of clovis as king at tournay in four eighty one to the death of conrad of franconia in nine eighteen it is the history of the franks that forms the central thread in the tangle of european affairs and it was in the person of charles the great that the frankish people made its special contribution to the life and thought of the middle ages in him the free teutonic spirit submitted itself to the conception of ordered rule that was the inheritance of the roman empire and both passed under the consecration of a religious sanction that turned the war leader of a teutonic tribe into the crusader and champion of the christian cause charles as he appears in the chronicles of the time is almost an ideal teutonic king of enormous physical strength resolute will and untiring energy he was a born leader of men except when moved by strong passion he was just and clement in his dealings with his enemies even his saxon antagonists bear testimony to his bravery and good faith though his policy embraced the whole western empire he remained an austrasian at heart and retained the language and costume of his native country and against the background of that rough and turbulent age he stands out as something not far short of the ideal of a christian king not free from the limitations of his own age an age that had learnt only too well from its moslem foes how to propagate the faith with the sword but keeping before him the true ideal of a christian society bound in the bond of brotherhood by common obedience to the christian law on the death of pippin the usual division of inheritance followed all the northern and more purely teutonic part of the frankish kingdom fell to charles as the eldest son the southern lands burgundy provence schwabia passed to his other son carloman a youth about ten years younger but for some reason that is not very clear the two sons of pippin did not succeed in cooperating with the same harmony as had marked the joint rule of their father and uncle an opportunity for the display of this ill feeling was afforded soon after their accession by a revolt in aquitaine led by hunold who after twenty years of monastic life returned to the world to avenge the death of his son Waffre. charles marched into aquitaine but carloman declined to help and left his brother to cope with the rebellion alone fortunately it did not prove a very difficult task hunold was defeated and surrendered to charles who sent him to rome to be dealt with by the pope for breach of his monastic vows after a short residence in a roman monastery he escaped to pavia where he was stoned to death meanwhile charles having built a fortress at fronsac to overawe the aquitanians returned in triumph to francia the next few years were occupied by charles in forging alliances with neighbouring states with a view to a possible conflict with carloman tassilo of bavaria charles's cousin had been a rebel against pippin's authority but charles overlooked this and entered into friendly relations with him several things made the friendship of the bavarian duke important 
bavaria lay between the frankish territories of the north and the passes of the alps beyond which lay the italy towards which charles's eyes may already have turned in another way tassilo linked francia and italy for he had married a daughter of desiderius king of the lombards and through him charles entered into a friendly understanding with the lombard king this understanding ripened into a proposal for a twofold marriage alliance between the two houses charles espousing desiderius's daughter desiderata and his sister gisela marrying desiderius's son adelchis even before queen bertha reached the roman court to announce these marriage arrangements to the new pope stephen the second he had sent an angry letter to the two frankish kings denouncing the proposed marriage between the ruler of francia and the leprous brood of the lombards but in spite of papal opposition the marriage took place and shortly after the pope was himself obliged to appeal for the help of desiderius in putting down a conspiracy at rome the details of which are rather obscure but the marriage of charles and desiderata was destined to the same unhappy ending as that of henry the eighth and catherine of aragon seven hundred years later desiderata was delicate and bore no children to her husband and a beautiful schwabian girl hildegard played the part of anne boleyn so charles repudiated his wife in spite of his mother bertha's protests and desiderata returned to her father at pavia soon after this the short-lived friendship between the lombard king and the pope came to an end desiderius felt the toils closing around him when the death of carloman threw into his hands a valuable hostage gerberga carloman's widow believing or affecting to believe that her two little sons were in danger fled with them to the lombard court where desiderius gave them welcome just at this stage pope stephen died and was succeeded by hadrian a stronger and perhaps abler leader who threw himself wholly into the policy of alliance with the franks and hostility to the lombards from that moment the doom of the lombard kingdom was certain the special purpose of desiderius was to sow dissension between charles and the pope by inducing hadrian to crown the two little sons of carloman in this he was supported by a lombard party among the papal advisers and when the pope discovered a treasonable correspondence going on between his chamberlain afiarta and desiderius and had his officer arrested and executed the lombard king set out for rome where he might have succeeded in deposing the pope and setting up a rival in his own interest but under threat of excommunication he hesitated at the frontier and finally turned back meanwhile hadrian sent in hot haste to charles appealing to him for help charles appears to have tried to avoid a final breach with the lombard king and sent commissioners to investigate the causes of quarrel between hadrian and desiderius but when desiderius refused all recognition of the claims of the pope to the cities that he had seized in the exarchate charles found himself obliged to act he gathered a great host at geneva and sent half under the command of his uncle bernhard through the st gorod pass while he led the other half through the mount Ceni, at the end of which he found the lombards under the king's son adelchis posted in a strong position from which they were only dislodged after some stiff fighting then after taking one by one the other cities of lombardy charles gathered all his forces round the capital city of pavia where desiderius with the remains of his army had taken refuge adelchis fled to constantinople where he became a useful pawn in the game that the eastern court found it convenient to play in june seven seventy four pavia fell and with its fall the lombards as a nation vanish from history the two little sons of carloman disappeared from the scene and desiderius and his wife ended their days in separate religious houses in francia while charles now adopted the title of rex francorum et langobardorum
it is impossible not to feel some regret at the disappearance of the last of those rulers of northern italy who might under happier circumstances have vindicated their right to the title of king of italy the lombards had come to italy an uncouth but virile race under the genial influence of italian skies they had lost much of their uncouthness and also not a little of their virility a hardier northern race broke their power at last and they were slowly merged and lost in the italian peoples among whom they made their home on the ruins of the lombard kingdom rose the two great powers that were destined to make the history of western europe for five hundred years the empire and the papacy before the fall of pavia at easter seven seventy four charles paid his first visit to rome it was the first time that a frankish king had visited the sacred city and every effort was made to do honour to his coming when he met the long procession of the roman clergy coming out with banners and songs to greet him he dismounted from his horse and so passed into the city there hadrian met him and ratified the holy league that united the papal destinies with those of the northern kingdom for seven days charles stayed in rome viewing the wonders of the city and falling under the spell of the ordered splendour of the church life that he saw around him one event of this visit has become the centre of great controversy let us hear the chronicler in the liber pontificalis on the fourth day of the week the pope with his officers went forth to the church of st peter and there meeting the king in conference earnestly entreated him and exhorted him with paternal affection that he would fulfil completely the promise that his father pippin of blessed memory had made and that he himself with his brother carloman and all the nobles of the franks had confirmed to st peter and his vicar pope stephen the second when he had visited francia that they would grant various cities and territories in that province of italy to st peter and his vicar for a perpetual possession and when the king had caused the promise that had been made in a place called carisiacum to be read over to him all its contents were approved by himself and his nobles and of his own accord with good and willing mind the most excellent and christian king caused another deed of gift to be drawn up like the first by atherius his chaplain and notary and in this he granted the same cities and territories to st peter and promised that they should be conveyed to the pope with their boundaries set forth as contained in the aforesaid donation namely from luna with the island of corsica thence to surianum thence to mons bardonis thence to parma thence to regium and from thence to mantua and mons Alicis, and also the whole exarchate of ravenna such as it was in old time and the provinces of venetia and istria and also the duchies of spoleto and beneventum many theories have been advanced as to the meaning of this passage which seems to imply that charles handed over to the pope practically all italy except part of the old lombard kingdom of the north and apparently calabria did he mean that whatever rights the emperor still retained in italy he now proposed to transfer to the pope that is perhaps the most reasonable explanation of the grant if the account can be relied upon but some are disposed to suspect the hand of the interpolator of a later time supplying material on which the popes of after ages might base claims unforeseen in the days when the frankish king and the roman pontiff met one thing at least is clear charles never acted as though he had conferred on the pope a position of independent sovereignty whatever had been the relation of the popes to the byzantine emperors at an earlier time that he regarded as their relation to himself they had merely transferred their allegiance to a new overlord better able to help but also better able to control End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the dawn of medieval europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by j h b masterman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami the saxon wars at the time of charles's accession to the frankish throne 
the northern frontier of his kingdom followed the line of the rhine as far as cologne and then turned east parallel with the course of the main till a little beyond the weser where the thuringian franks fronted the slavonic tribes farther east north of this frontier line the territories of the saxons stretched up to the borders of denmark and along the elbe like the franks and the alemannians the saxons were a confederation of teutonic tribes whose original home had been in holstein from early times they had taken to a seafaring life and became the terror of the frisian and british coasts in the last days of the roman rule with the fall of roman authority in the west many of them had crossed the channel to find new homes in britain while others turned southward and occupied the district between the elbe and the rhine among the saxons local independence was strong each district had its own chief and it is doubtful whether there was any general assembly of the saxons like the marchfield of the franks a certain bond of union seems to have been supplied by a sacred pole called the irminsul which had apparently been carried with them in their migrations and finally placed in the woods at Erisburg, where gatherings for tribal worship were occasionally held for practical purposes the saxons were at this time divided into four groups the nord liudi north of the elbe the ostfali on the left bank of the elbe the agrarii in the valley of the weser and the westfali between the weser and the rhine they lived under strict laws in scattered villages and were masters of the art of guerrilla warfare no missionary had yet penetrated into their country and though pippin had reduced them to a nominal submission they remained still practically independent charles was moved to undertake the conquest of the saxons partly to protect the frontier lands from their raids but even more by a desire to bring these heathen tribes to christianity he could hardly have foreseen that by that work of conquest he was preparing the way for the shifting of the centre of gravity of the eastern kingdom from the frank to the saxon from aachen on the rhine to magdeburg on the elbe and so preparing also for the development of the more romanized west francia into a separate kingdom of france charles's wars with the saxons lasted for thirty years and involved at least eighteen campaigns in seven seventy two he led his first expedition into saxony stormed the fort of erisburg and destroyed the irmansul in much the same spirit of untempered zeal as that in which the israelites of old destroyed the idols of canaan the saxons pretended submission and gave hostages and the frankish army withdrew in the following year while charles was in italy they had their revenge crossing the frontier they burnt the church of deventer while another band raided the hessian villages and set fire to the church of st boniface at Fritzlar. but by what was thought to be miraculous intervention the flames went out on charles's return the raiders retreated followed by some frankish cavalry who did considerable damage in the following spring charles prepared for revenge and formulated the policy of offering the saxons the alternative of death or baptism he marched into saxony seized and fortified the strong positions of siegesburg and erisburg the first beginning of the network of forts that he gradually constructed throughout saxony and received the usual submission of the ostfali and the agrarii both of whom agreed if charles would waive the condition of forcible conversion to admit christian missionaries into their lands he then turned on the westfali who had made an attack on his camp and compelled them also to submit in the following year charles was called away by a crisis in italy and the saxons took advantage of the opportunity to break into revolt and besieged the garrisons of siegeburg and erisburg charles hastened home gathered a great army at Wurms, and marched into saxony only to be met with the usual offers of surrender 
he took fresh hostages organized a more systematic mission under one sturm of fulda and built a palace and church at paderborn the leader of the rising a westphalian chieftain named widukind or widukind fled to denmark and in 778 he returned and roused the saxons to fresh rebellion they broke into hesse ravaging and slaughtering and even reached cologne where they burned the church of st martin the season was too far advanced for a frankish campaign that year but in june of 779 charles once more led a great army into saxony and after one pitched battle reduced the westphali to submission the king now built a number of forts connected with roads reaching as far as the elba which now formed the eastern frontier of the frankish kingdom he tried to secure the allegiance of the tribal chiefs by giving them frank titles and large endowments he also endeavoured to force christianity on the saxons by rigorous laws and this appears to have been the cause of the rebellion that broke out as soon as he had withdrawn Vidukint was again the soul of the movement from which the local chiefs seem to have held off many of them as hostages had lived in francia and had probably become reconciled to the idea of incorporation in the dominions of charles and they were also jealous apparently of the power of Vidukint over the people it was this inability to cooperate that was fatal to all the saxon risings in many ways the saxons in their relation with the franks remind us of the highland clans in scotland in their relations with the scottish kings of the lowlands this rebellion of 780 was perhaps the most fierce of all Vidukint even invited the help of the slavs from beyond the elba and the christian saxons were treated with merciless cruelty the arrival of charles on the scene led to the usual scattering of the rebels but when he put four thousand five hundred saxons to the sword at verden for complicity in the rising a general outbreak followed and for three years he was obliged to wage strenuous war first defeating the enemy in the open field and then systematically burning the villages and devastating the country so sternly was the work done that it seemed as though the spirit of resistance was finally broken and even Vidukint abandoned the contest and submitted to baptism at Atigny, after which we hear no more of him in the history of the time a few years of peace followed and then rebellion blazed up again it began with the destruction of some frankish troops who had been sent to the mouth of the elba in 792 and in the following year count theodoric one of charles's best generals was slain and his army destroyed near rustringen this disaster the worst that had yet befallen the royal cause in saxony was followed by a general repudiation of christianity as a dog returns to his vomit so did they return to the paganism which they had aforetime deserted they laid waste the churches that were within their border with fire and sword they rejected the bishops and priests that were set over them some they took prisoners and others they slew charles who was busy with his avar campaign conceived the idea of digging a canal between the Reitzat and the Altmühl by which he could transport his soldiers northwards or eastwards as occasion required but after a multitude of men had toiled at the task for months the swampy nature of the ground defeated the enterprise from seven ninety four to seven ninety nine each year had its saxon campaign charles now carried out a new policy of transplanting large bodies of saxons into francia and filling their vacant lands with franks or in the case of holstein with slavs he also carried a number of saxon youths to francia and had them brought up there as ecclesiastics so that he might be able to send missionaries of the saxon race to evangelize their fellow countrymen after eight o three the long record of saxon rising ceases and charles was able gradually to modify the strictness of his rule the three great seas of osnabruck bremen and verden became centres of missionary activity and the saxons now incorporated in the empire guarded the eastern frontiers against the slavonic tribes beyond <laughs>
a hundred years later a saxon duke was destined to supplant the carolingian house in east francia and to found a new dynasty of german sovereigns End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of the dawn of medieval europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by j h b masterman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami charles king of the franks seven seventy three to seven ninety nine the story of the saxon wars has carried us down to nearly the end of charles's reign we must now return to the earlier years of it and take up the thread of general history for some time after his conquest of the lombard kingdom the affairs of italy gave the king some anxiety hadrian was tactless and somewhat grasping in his claims on the neighbouring dukes of italy and something like a general conspiracy against pope and king appears to have been hatched in seven seventy five rothgod duke of friuli the duke of beneventum and the emperor constantine being all involved but the emperor died the duke of beneventum hung back and hrothgod was left to face the frankish power alone the course of events that followed is somewhat obscure apparently charles descended on northern italy early in seven seventy six slew the revolting duke dispersed his followers and so reduced lombardy once more to subjection the supporters of Rothgod were punished by the confiscation of their property. Scarcely had this Italian issue been laid to rest for a time when an entirely new direction was given to Charles's policy by a visit from three rebellious Saracen chiefs from Spain who came to him at Paderborn to ask for his assistance against their overlord. In 750, the Omeyad dynasty at Damascus had been overthrown by the rival faction of the Abbasides, and Abdurrahman, the only survivor of the family of the dispossessed caliphs, fled to North Africa and a few years later crossed into Spain, where a series of victories made him master of the country that had been under the rule of several mutually hostile chiefs. At Cordova, he established the capital of a Moslem kingdom that was destined to last for nearly three centuries and to leave an indelible stamp on the history of spain it was on behalf of the abbaside party that charles was now invited to intervene and there is no reason to think that the religious motive counted for much in his decision perhaps charles cherished some hope of adding spain or at least part of it to his dominions perhaps he was led on by the mere love of adventure whatever the motive he agreed to march into spain the Abbasside chiefs undertaking to raise forces from Africa and in Spain to assist him, an undertaking that they failed to carry out. With a great army of Franks, Lombards, Bavarians, and men of the southern provinces, Charles set out in the spring of 778 for Saragossa. It is with some surprise that we find him on the way laying siege to Pampluna, a city belonging to the little Christian kingdom of the Asturias, of which he demolished the walls. This was the only success of the expedition, of the details of which the chroniclers are strangely silent. All that is clear is that Charles turned homeward, taking one of the rebel chiefs with him in chains, and that on the way through the defile of the Roncesvalles, his rear guard was attacked by the wild Basques of the Pyrenees and a number of his nobles including roland the count of the breton march were slain around this event later ages wove a tissue of romance of which we shall say something in a later chapter the campaign is notable as the only unsuccessful attempt of charles to extend the frontiers of his kingdom it was left for his son and successor to retrieve his father's failure and carry the frontiers of the spanish march as far as the banks of the ebro after staying a few weeks in aquitaine possibly to avert the danger of arising there charles led his army back to francia and once more turned his attention to italian affairs 
these now became entangled with the fortunes and misfortunes of tassilo of bavaria we have already seen him as the rebellious vassal of his uncle king pippin and as the ally of charles at the beginning of his reign the fortunes of bavaria were naturally closely connected with those of lombardy from which it was only separated by the rampart of the alps tassilo had married a daughter of the deposed lombard king and her influence would naturally be exercised to sow dissension between her husband and the king of the franks but behind all merely personal questions lay the deep-seated antagonism between the germans of the north and the germans of the south an antagonism lasting far into the middle ages if indeed it can be said to have even now entirely disappeared there are some provinces of europe that seem to have a natural claim to an independent life and yet that have always found that independence menaced by the expansion of more powerful neighbours burgundy and aquitaine failed to make good their claim to a national life of their own bavaria more fortunate in the end only succeeded by centuries of contest in avoiding the danger of absorption in the german kingdom of the north but though charles might suspect tassilo of plotting fresh treason he could not treat a christian power ruled by his own first cousin as he treated heathen saxony or rebellious lombardy his first task was to win the pope to the support of his cause and for that purpose he visited rome in seven eighty one taking with him his wife and two of his children carloman and louis carloman was baptized by the pope and his name changed to pippin and the two boys were then anointed as kings of italy and aquitaine charles may have thought that he could satisfy the local patriotism of these two recently annexed parts of the frankish kingdom by his recognition of their local independence and probably hoped that as the boys grew up they might relieve him of the details of administration in these southern provinces the problem of bavaria was discussed by the king and the pope and hadrian whose friendship for charles had been somewhat cooled by what he regarded as inadequate support in his claims against the archbishop of ravenna and the southern dukes now agreed to join the king in sending an embassy to tassilo to require him to remember his oath of allegiance tassilo could not afford to quarrel with the church authorities on whose support his power in bavaria depended and accordingly so greatly was his heart softened that he declared his willingness to proceed to the presence of the king if such hostages could be given as would leave him no doubt of his safety these being furnished the bavarian duke repaired to worms and there solemnly renewed his oath of allegiance and gave hostages for his obedience six years passed before the affairs of bavaria again became a cause of anxiety to charles the only event of importance in these years in italy was the submission of Aricus, the great duke of beneventum to the frankish king in seven eighty seven charles again visited rome and the matter of tassilo's loyalty was once more discussed between the king and the pope what new ground for suspicion tassilo had given we do not know but something in the attitude of the duke alienated the sympathy of the pope who after a last attempt at reconciliation left charles a free hand to deal with his recalcitrant vassal from all sides charles poured frankish armies into bavaria and tassilo finding resistance hopeless made submission handing over to the king in token of his surrender a wand the top of which was carved into the likeness of a man an early indication of the growth of the idea of homage but within a year charles believed that tassilo was renewing his schemes of rebellion and he was summoned to ingelheim where he was placed on trial before the assembled magnates of the franks bavarians lombards and saxons and judged guilty of treason the gravest charge against him being that he had invited the avars to invade the kingdom with all his family he was condemned to enter the monastic life and he disappears into the monastery of jumiege to reappear for the last time at frankfurt in seven ninety four when at the great council he made a final declaration of his repentance and renounced all claims on his bavarian inheritance 
bavaria now passed under the direct rule of the frankish king the annexation of bavaria brought the kingdom of charles to the borders of the old roman province of pannonia which was now occupied by the avars we have seen already how this tribe from central asia disturbed the byzantine emperors and even attacked constantinople itself since then they had settled in pannonia where they occupied themselves with agriculture and raids on the western provinces of europe the bavarian dukes had been the defenders of the frontier against these heathen marauders and charles now took up the duty a raid made by the avars in seven eighty eight which was checked by the count of the marches gave him an excuse for organizing a great crusade against them the various tribes of the avars lived in fortified kraals or rings the largest of them being that of the chagan or head chief west of the rab here protected by nine concentric ramparts as wide across as from zurich to constance the accumulated treasures of two centuries of plundering were stored after some ineffective attempts at negotiation probably undertaken merely to gain time for military preparations charles led his army against the avars the ground on which the frankish magnates agreed to the expedition was the great and intolerable malice which the avars have shown toward the holy church and the christian people the campaign started in seven ninety one was undertaken in something of the spirit of a crusade opening with three days of fasting and litanies the frankish army marched along both banks of the danube the commissariat being conveyed down the river in boats the expedition was little more than a military parade the avars who were divided among themselves made no resistance though charles penetrated as far as the rob returning to ratisbon in time for christmas this was the only campaign against the avars led by charles in person the conduct of the war fell to eric duke of friuli a devout and noble soldier who in seven ninety five penetrated to the central fortress of the chagan took possession of the vast stores of treasure hoarded in his stronghold and sent them to charles at aachen in fifteen great wagons the king gave rich gifts to his nobles and sent presents to the pope and others including offa king of mercia who received a baldric a hunnish sword and two silk cloaks in the following year pippin king of italy completed the destruction of the avar kingdom and drove the avars beyond the Teis. a desultory war went on along the frontier for some years partly against the remnants of the avars and partly against slavonic tribes that pressed in to settle in the vacant lands in seven ninety nine the valiant gerald duke of bavaria brother of charles's wife hildegard fell in contest with some avars and in the same year the heroic eric of friuli died slain in an ambush laid by the croatians paulinus bishop of aquileia who had dedicated to him a book of devotional meditations some years before now wrote a dirge for his friend modelled on david's lament over saul the remnants of the avar people accepted christianity and settled in the ostmark and slav tribes filled the vacant province of the middle danube till a fresh inroad of turanian people from beyond the confines of europe the magyars reoccupied the lands from which huns and avars had been successively driven while these wars were going on charles was occupied with the internal affairs of his kingdom in the year seven eighty three he lost his wife hildegard and his mother bertha a few months after he married fastrada the daughter of an austrasian count a woman of strong but apparently harsh and vindictive character to her influence einhardt attributes not a few of charles's unpopular acts during this period of his reign an obscure revolt of the thuringian nobles in eight eighty six is said to have been due to her actions and just after the first avar campaign charles had to meet a more serious conspiracy in which the leading part was played by pippin the hunchback charles's son by an early irregular marriage the plot was betrayed and the leaders arrested and condemned to death pippin was allowed to enter the monastery of prum 
where he disappears from history two years later fastrada died and charles married as his fourth wife liutgarda of schwabia the year seven ninety eight was one of disturbance in the kingdom the avar war was still going on and the saxons were as usual turbulent in addition to this the saracens broke into septimania which they ravaged carrying off many of the inhabitants into slavery and grimwald duke of beneventum whom charles had held as a hostage during his father's lifetime but had allowed to return to the duchy after his death threw off his allegiance and became the centre of the anti-frankish party in italy a few years before this a quarrel between charles and the empire led to an invasion of southern italy by the greeks who were met by a combined frankish and lombard force under the dukes of spoleto and beneventum and completely defeated but after this the young duke of beneventum grew more restive under the frankish yoke and in 791 Pippin and Louis were ordered by their father to invade the duchy. Beyond devastating part of the territory, they do not appear to have achieved much success. The contest with Beneventum lingered on for years, resolving itself into a duel between Pippin, king of Italy, assisted by the Duke of Spoleto and Grimwald. Finally, the death of Grimwald in 806 led to the secession of hostilities to make the account of these years complete something must be said about charles's relations with offa king of mercia now overlord of the greater part of england the two kings appear to have become acquainted in connection with offa's scheme for an archbishopric of lichfield and they carried on a correspondence for some years offa is even said to have invited charles to join him in 787 in deposing hadrian from the papal chair a little later a quarrel broke out between the two kings in connection with the proposed marriage of offa's daughter with charles's eldest son and namesake for some reason a suggestion by offa that charles's daughter bertha should marry his son aroused the frankish king's resentment for some time the relations between the two kings was strained and an embargo was laid by charles on english merchants travelling through his kingdom but the influence of alcuin was exercised in favour of peace and in seven ninety five charles writes in the friendliest terms to his beloved friend and brother offa as for pilgrims who wish to approach the threshold of the apostles let them travel in peace without any molestation let merchants pay toll at the accustomed places we take them under our protection if they have any complaints let them come to us or to our judges and they shall have justice we send herewith some dalmatics and palls from our stores to your bishop sees and to those of ethelfrid begging that you will have intercession made for the soul of pope hadrian also we send you a baldric a hunnish sword and two silk cloaks offa died soon after this and charles's further relations with england belong to a later period charles's ecclesiastical policy during the pontificate of hadrian turns almost entirely around two controversies the first of these was the so-called adoptionist heresy this was propounded by a spanish monk felix bishop of urgel who taught that jesus christ was a man who was adopted by god as his son having obtained from the pope a condemnation of this doctrine charles held a series of councils for its condemnation alcuin being specially the champion of orthodoxy the other was the iconoclastic controversy in regard to which it was necessary for the frankish church to define its position at the second council of nicaea irene had secured the restoration of image worship and thus brought the policy of the empire into accord with that of the pope but charles was not disposed to submit to the dictation of the eastern court and in 790 he caused to be drawn up an elaborate refutation of image worship the celebrated libri carolini his attitude toward the whole question was one of toleration let pictures be in the churches if so desired to preserve in the minds of the people the memory of bible stories but their presence there should be optional not compulsory and as to insisting on their being worshipped 
as the impertinent and arrogant council at bithynia had lately done that could in no wise be tolerated in 794 charles called a council of frankish bishops at frankfurt when the seventh ecumenical council was formally condemned as neither seventh nor ecumenical but absolutely superfluous charles also addressed a letter to the pope inviting him to join in the condemnation of the image worshippers hadrian sent a long reply pointing out what he regarded as the errors of charles's position and winding up with the usual appeal for the restoration of the patrimonies of st peter in southern italy and sicily shortly after this hadrian died and with the appointment of his successor begins the course of events that led to the coronation of charles as roman emperor five years later End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the dawn of medieval europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by j h b masterman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami carolus imperator for thirty years charles had reigned as king of the franks and during this period he had extended the frontiers of his kingdom in all directions till it included excepting spain and britain all and more than all the european lands that had owned the sway of the roman empire but the empire still lived on in its new capital in the east and there is no reason to think that charles ever contemplated during the first twenty-five years of his reign the idea of superseding the somewhat shadowy authority that the byzantine rulers exercised over italy but inevitably his relations with the ecclesiastical world drew him more and more into the position of protector of the pope especially as the iconoclastic controversy had practically severed whatever bonds of allegiance bound the popes to the isaurian emperors yet the anomalous condition of europe might have lasted on for much longer had not irene's rise to power destroyed whatever respect had been felt in the west for the imperial house europe was for the first time without an emperor and just at this moment a series of events happened that made an emperor specially necessary at the end of the year seven ninety five hadrian died and leo the third seven ninety five to eight sixteen was elected in his place the new pope was apparently the nominee of a party and there is some reason to think that rumours unfavourable to his integrity and moral conduct had reached charles at all events in signifying his assent to the appointment the king lays stress on the importance to a pope of purity of life and honourable conduct he pictures the relation between the pope and himself as like that between moses praying on the mountain and joshua smiting the enemies of the lord in the valley below it is ours with the help of the divine piety externally to defend the holy church of christ by our arms from all pagan inroads and infidel devastations and internally to fortify it by the recognition of the christian faith it is yours holy father with hands raised to god like moses to help our warfare that by your intercession the christian people may everywhere have the victory over its enemies and the name of our lord jesus christ may be magnified throughout the whole world from the first difficulties gathered round the path of the new pope two of the nephews of the late pope pascalus and compulus took the lead in opposing his authority but four years passed before the conspirators felt strong enough to act and then having spread scandalous reports against the character of the pope they proceeded to seize him in april seven ninety nine as he was riding through the streets of rome their purpose was to adopt the barbarous byzantine custom of blinding their captive and cutting out his tongue but for some reason the brutal work was only half done and leo was rescued by some friends and taken to st peter's church outside the walls whence he was conducted into safety by the duke of spoleto 
having driven out the pope the conspirators appear to have had no further plans they did not set up an anti-pope or organize any sort of government in rome the events that had happened were reported to charles then engaged in one of his saxon campaigns he instructed his lieutenants to send the pope to paderborn thither accordingly leo repaired accompanied by a great train of nobles and ecclesiastics he was accorded a respectful welcome and requested to consecrate the new church at paderborn he stayed at the frankish court for some months and then returned to rome accompanied by a number of leading frankish ecclesiastics and counts these companions of his journey constituted the body of commissioners appointed by charles to hear the accusations against leo and give judgment on them but where in all this do the rights of the nominal overlord of the pope find recognition and if the pope felt it useless to turn to the byzantine ruler for protection and vindication did not that fact in itself imply that rome was free to beget a new emperor as she had begotten the augustus of eight hundred years before leo's return to rome was a great contrast to his departure a few months before the romans anxious to avert the possible vengeance of charles or perhaps influenced by a genuine revulsion of feeling poured out to welcome the returning pope who entered the city amid tumultuous signs of rejoicing the commissioners summoned Pascalus and Compulus before them, adjudged their accusations as groundless, and sent them to Francia for Charles to deal with. In the months that elapsed before Charles was free to visit Rome again, an interesting and significant incident occurred in the arrival of an embassy from the Patriarch of Jerusalem, bringing relics and gifts to the Frankish king. A little later, a second envoy brought to charles the banner of jerusalem and the keys of the holy sepulchre it would appear as though the christians now living under moslem rule in the east despairing of help from constantinople were turning to the great western power as the champion of the cause of christendom early in the year eight hundred charles set out for rome stopping on the way to visit the great abbey of san martin at tours where alcuin was now installed as abbot it was his first visit to neustria for more than twenty years his stay at tours was prolonged and saddened by the death of his wife liutgarda after leaving tours he travelled to paris aachen and mainz and then in the autumn moved south with a considerable army and crossed the alps arriving at the end of november at rome where he was welcomed with much ceremony his earliest task was to lay finally to rest the charges that had been made against leo and at a great assembly of the roman church dignitaries a last opportunity was given for any who wished to accuse the pope no accusers being forthcoming leo solemnly purged himself on oath of all the charges that had been made by his enemies two days later on christmas day eight hundred during the mass at st peter's which was attended by the king and his frankish nobles the pope suddenly produced a golden crown which he placed on the head of charles while the whole assembled congregation joined in the shout to charles augustus crowned of god the great and pacific emperor long life and victory charles was then invested with the imperial insignia and a solemn litany sung invoking the protection of the saints on the new emperor such a ceremony as this must have been prearranged and it is difficult to believe that the pope would have conferred the imperial title on charles without first ascertaining that he would approve yet there is some reason for thinking that charles was taken by surprise einhardt says that he afterwards declared that he would never have entered the church on that day if he had foreseen the pope's designs this may be only a sigh of regret from one who found that the imperial dignity had brought him more anxiety than pleasure but it may mean that though the idea of the imperial restoration had been discussed the pope brought the matter prematurely to an issue to charles's frankish nobles and to the people of rome the coronation would have meant little more than the recognition of existing facts 
for all practical purposes charles had already succeeded to the rights and responsibilities that the byzantine rulers could no longer effectively fulfil and as fifty years before zacharias on the ground that he who exercised the powers of king should have the name of king had sanctioned the setting aside of the last merovingian so now it seemed good that he who exercised imperial functions and ruled over the imperial cities in the west should have the title of emperor to the pope the crowning of charles meant the final repudiation of the authority of the emperor at constantinople any attempt of the eastern empire to interfere in italy would now have to reckon with the power of charles and his frankish armies it probably meant little more in after ages vast claims were destined to grow out of the papal share in this restoration of the western empire claims that leo could only have foreseen very dimly if indeed he foresaw them at all but what did it mean to charles it meant the consecration of his mission as the guardian and protector of the christian faith the ratification of the relationship that had been growing up through centuries between the old world and the new as constantine and his successors had ruled the empire from constantinople so now a new line of emperors would rule it from aachen logically the transfer of the imperial title involved the denial of the right of the byzantine rulers to it but charles had no wish to push the theory to this logical issue and was prepared to admit the authority of the existing imperial house in the east so long as he might remain unchallenged emperor in the west the imperial office in his conception of it involved a definite moral responsibility no pope interpreted his office as vice-regent of god more strictly than did the new emperor the spirit in which he tried to rule is shown by the capitulary of eight hundred and two which prescribed a new oath on all his subjects it shall be publicly explained to all what is the force and meaning of this oath and how much more it includes than a mere promise of fidelity to the monarch's person firstly it binds those who swear it to live each and every one of them according to his strength and knowledge in the holy service of god since the lord emperor cannot extend over all his care and discipline secondly it binds them neither by force nor fraud to seize or molest any of the goods or servants of his crown thirdly to do no violence nor treason toward the holy church or to widows or orphans or strangers seeing that the lord emperor has been appointed after the lord and his saints the protector and defender of all such it was in the ecclesiastical authority that he deemed himself to have as roman emperor that he hoped to find the bond of union that should bind together all the peoples whom the might of the frankish sword had brought under his sway over franks bavarians saxons lombards the church had thrown the meshwork of a common organization this organization centred in rome and as master of rome charles might hope to extend his authority wherever the claims of rome were recognized the great scheme broke down chiefly because old tribal feelings were too strong and the new bond of union too weak but the coronation of charles the great is not only the beginning of an experiment that failed it is much more truly the culmination of a process that had brought the vigorous and turbulent life of the teutonic peoples under the sway of those conceptions of ordered rule and discipline that were the greatest legacy that the old rome of augustus and antoninus had bequeathed to the newer rome of gregory and hadrian from rome charles returned to germany in the following year and the last fourteen years of his reign were spent in organization and legislation no fresh lands were added to his empire but the existing provinces were bound into closer union it is said that charles contemplated a marriage with irene so uniting east and west but the story is extremely improbable and the revolution at constantinople which was due partly to the revolt of the west soon brought irene's period of rule to an end from the new emperor charles succeeded after tedious negotiations 
in securing a partial recognition of his title the most important events of eight hundred and four were the end of the saxon war and a visit of the pope to aachen to charles's court came messengers from many lands there egbert of wessex found refuge when expelled from england by bertric the extent of charles's interference in english affairs is not very clear but he probably assisted egbert's return in eight hundred and two and perhaps inspired the policy that gave to wessex twenty-five years later the overlordship of england in eight o eight another dispossessed english king eardolf of northumbria came to ask for help at the imperial court and by the joint help of emperor and pope was restored to his throne from the far east came an embassy from the great caliph harun al rashid bringing an elephant abu lahaz as a gift to the new emperor but under the outward prosperity of charles's closing years there were not wanting ominous indications of danger the northern coasts were already being plundered by scandinavian pirates and the saracens were beginning to harry the shores of the mediterranean danes and slavs were restive on the frontiers the story told by the monk of st gall of how charles sitting at meat in his palace at narbonne saw the white sails of a viking ship and wept bitterly as he foretold the woes that were coming on his subjects though probably a later legend expresses a true fact charles's last years must sometimes have been saddened by forebodings of possible disaster they were saddened also by domestic grief in eight ten pippin the brave and noble young king of italy died at the early age of thirty-three while campaigning in dalmatia next year the emperor's eldest son charles died and louis alone remained to inherit the kingdom in eight thirteen charles held a great assembly at aachen at which he presented his son to the nobles as his successor early in the following year he died in the seventy-second year of his age and the forty-seventh of his reign until the accession of charles the frankish kingdom had no fixed capital in the early part of his reign he carried on the administration of his kingdom chiefly from his three palaces at Würms, ingelheim and nimegen but after seven ninety five he made his home at the city between the rhine and the meuse that the romans called aquaigrani the german aachen and the french aix la chapelle charles was attracted to the place by its hot medicinal springs and there he built a palace and a church for the adornment of which churches at rome and ravenna were plundered of their treasures around aachen stretched wide parks where charles and his courtiers rode and hunted of charles's personal character and habits his biographer einhardt gives us much interesting information he was a mighty eater with a special love for roast meats and found the church's rules of fasting hard to observe in the matter of drink he was temperate and strove to discourage drunkenness among his officers and courtiers he was wont to have books read to him at the evening meal either history or the works of st augustine whose city of god was his special favourite he knew latin and some greek but in spite of earnest efforts never succeeded in learning to write he was interested in the literature of his native land and tried to preserve the old teutonic ballads of the franks of which he had a collection made unfortunately his successor louis the pious deeming them mere relics of paganism caused the book to be destroyed of his personal appearance and habits einhardt has much to tell his gait was firm all the habit of his body manly his voice clear but scarcely corresponding to his stature his health good except that during the last four years of his life he was often attacked with fever and at the last he limped with one foot he guided himself much more by his own fancy than by the counsel of his physicians whom he disliked because they tried to persuade him to give up roast meats to which he was accustomed and to take to boiled he kept up diligently his exercises of riding and hunting in which he followed the custom of his nation he delighted in the steam of hot water baths being a frequent and skilful swimmer 
not only did he invite his sons to the bath but also his friends and nobles sometimes even a crowd of courtiers and bodyguards so that at times as many as a hundred men or more would be bathing together he loved foreigners and took the greatest pains to entertain them so that their number often seemed a real burden not only to the palace but even to the kingdom he was full even to overflowing with eloquence and could express all his ideas with great clearness he was in truth so eloquent that he seemed like a professional rhetorician he was a devout and zealous supporter of the christian religion in which he had been instructed from infancy he regularly attended the church that he had built at aquas granum morning and evening and also in the hours of the night and at the time of sacrifice as far as his health permitted and he took great pains that all the rites celebrated there should be performed with the greatest decorum constantly admonishing the ministers of the church that they should not allow anything dirty or unbecoming to be brought there he took great pains to reform the style of reading and singing in both of which he was highly accomplished of the genuineness of his piety there can be no doubt he was anxious not only to further the extension of christianity but also to purify it of the corruptions that threatened to destroy its vitality a certain grim humour appears in some of the stories that tradition has handed down of his dealings with worldly and grasping ecclesiastics while his sons were provided as they grew up with local courts of their own his daughters remained at home and travelled with him when he moved about his kingdom as those daughters were most beautiful and he loved them dearly it was strange that he never gave one of them in marriage either to one of his own people or to a foreigner but kept them always with him in the house till the day of his death declaring that he could not dispense with their daily companionship einhardt hints at scandals that charles bore with fortitude and no doubt there was a less pleasing side to the life of the frankish court charles himself was far from immaculate judged by the standard of strict christian principle but the life of courts has seldom proved a training ground of domestic virtues and on the whole the court of charles the great stands out in the chronicles of the time as an oasis of cheerful home life amid the wars and turbulence of a rough and uncouth age End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the dawn of medieval europe four seventy six to nine eighteen by j h b masterman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami law and administration in the empire charles inherited from his predecessors the administrative system that the frankish rulers had gradually developed out of the primitive teutonic arrangements that the franks had brought with them from their northern home to this he added from time to time so that by the end of his reign the empire was governed by a system of administration that appeared adequate and efficient but as a matter of fact it was neither for charles was unable to develop an efficient and trustworthy body of officials the byzantine empire was strong even when it seemed most weak because it was served by a body of well-trained and well-paid civil servants but the carolingian empire was weak even when it seemed strongest because charles had to depend on officers who were untrained and unpaid but the byzantine empire only retained its bureaucratic system by a burden of taxation such as charles dared not lay on the shoulders of his free franks or even on the subject nations of his empire the burden of military service and the tithes that were levied by royal authority for religious purposes often provoked strong resentment and the expense of government had consequently to be kept down at all costs but this could only be done by acting through unpaid agents who were likely to prove either inefficient or corrupt at the head of the whole system was the emperor who as emperor recognized no earthly superior but as king of the franks was bound to act in consultation with his great nobles and at least nominally with the armed warriors who assembled every spring at the annual mayfield a smaller gathering was held in the autumn at which probably 
only the great magnates attended it was at these assemblies that fresh laws were promulgated and questions of peace or war decided the two most important outlying provinces of the empire italy and aquitaine charles entrusted to his two younger sons who each had a court of his own and was left free in the administration of his own kingdom subject to the general control of the emperor the dukes of the other great provinces had been dispossessed in favour of the direct authority of the frankish king but along all the frontier of the empire a new and important class of officers had grown up in the margraves of the marches in the south the duke of spoleto acted as margrave and carried on a desultory war with the lombard duke of beneventum the margrave of friuli defended the eastern frontiers of italy and the province of istria was also a kind of march on the eastern frontier of the frankish kingdom along the danube the ostmark ruled by two margraves kept back the flood of slavonic invasion from bavaria and farther north in bohemia the empire had driven a wedge of conquest into the slavonic world along the elba and on the danish frontier other margraves kept watch and the circle of frontier defences was completed by the breton march where roland was at one time warden and the spanish march in the south where the count of toulouse waged almost constant war against the saracens to complete the defences of the empire a frankish fleet was constructed which guarded the channel for a while from the raids of the norsemen internally the empire was divided into counties pagus each ruled by a count nominally appointed by the emperor but really holding the position of a local hereditary magnate each count had his court or malus in the central town of his county the custom of the frankish kingdom was that every man should be judged by the law of his own nation but in practice this resolved itself into a sort of equitable jurisdiction based partly on common sense partly on the personal will of the count from whom impartial justice could hardly be expected in matters where his own interests were affected the pagus was subdivided into hundreds each under a local officer appointed by the count into this system the emperor introduced two changes the frankish kings were accustomed to send missi on various errands into the provinces of the kingdom charles now created a new body of permanent missi dominici leading nobles of the kingdom who travelled around definite circuits supervising the local administration and acting as inspectors of all departments of government but several things rendered their work ineffective the circuits were too large for effective supervision the missi were unpaid and only held office for short periods and the local counts appear to have evaded their control in various ways as for example by persuading suitors to hold back their cases till the unwelcome intruders had paid their visit the other change was the creation of a kind of jury of scabini who were intended to act with the count in the administration of justice but for various reasons these scabini do not appear to have been an effective body and local justice continued to depend on the count the central government was nominally a bureaucracy really an autocracy charles had his arch chaplain for the management of ecclesiastical business and a body of counts for the palace comes palatii one for each nation of the empire who were supposed to deal with appeals from the local counts the most important being referred to the emperor but in fact the emperor partly because of the dearth of competent officers and partly through the unwillingness of a strong ruler to delegate power retained in his own hands the actual work of government a suitor who could secure access to the emperor could generally count on justice and at the mayfield assemblies charles mixed freely with his subjects but a system built up around the person of the sovereign was bound to break down when his powers grew enfeebled with age or his sceptre passed into hands less able to wield it the lack of a trained body of secular officials threw charles back on the support of the great ecclesiastics 
who were already rising to a position of great wealth and influence the work of resumption of church lands that had cost charles martel the goodwill of the monkish chroniclers now began to be undone two significant facts appear in the capitularies of the closing years of the reign one is the growing difficulty of securing from the freemen of the empire the military service that they were liable to furnish now that the wars of the emperor were no longer wars of conquest in which plunder and glory might be gained the interruption of ordinary life caused by military service was resented to meet this difficulty a new system was adopted that was destined to have far-reaching consequences liability to military service was now made territorial instead of personal a certain area of land being made responsible for furnishing a warrior to the host the inhabitants sharing the duty or furnishing a deputy the other significant fact is the growth of the system of vassalage freemen began to commend themselves to the local count or ecclesiastic securing protection in return for certain services so begins the feudal system of the development of which more must be said in a later chapter the frankish kingdom had held together while the process of conquest had kept alive the sentiment of loyalty as soon as the extension of the kingdom ceased local feeling reasserted itself and this process of disintegration had begun even before charles handed on the sceptre to the less masterful hands of his son charles made no attempt to compile a legal code for his empire but he endeavoured to reduce the various national systems of law under which the peoples of his empire were living to better order after his assumption of the imperial title says einhardt as he perceived that many things were lacking in the laws of his people he thought to add those things that were wanting to reconcile discrepancies and to correct what was bad and ill-expressed but of all this he accomplished nothing except that he added a few chapters and those imperfect ones to the laws of the franks all the legal customs however of the various nations under his sway he caused to be committed to writing if they were not already written but it is in his capitularies that the legislative activity of charles shows itself these capitularies were edicts issued by the emperor from time to time many of them before his acceptance of the imperial title in consultation with his nobles regulating the affairs of church and state they were collected into books in the ninth century but they were not to be thought of as a code of law some of them are royal proclamations some ordinances some instructions to the missi or answers to their questions some appear to be no more than notes jotted down by the emperor of things he wanted to remember in his history of civilization guizot attempts to classify these capitularies according to subject matter it would be impossible to deal with them in any detail here they show the wide range of charles's administrative activity and the sincerity of his efforts to enforce the christian moral standard on his people in all probability many of them remained pious opinions pointing to a standard of life far in advance of anything that the frankish kingdom was capable of reaching End of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of the Dawn of Medieval Europe, four seventy six to nine eighteen by J. H. B. Masterman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Alcuin and the Revival of Learning, John Scotus. In the sixth and seventh centuries, learning in Europe was reduced to a very low ebb schools were rare and the church authorities had already begun to frown on secular studies as corrupting to the student in the early part of the seventh century isidore bishop of seville had a high reputation for learning he was a voluminous writer and his books formed the textbooks for students in the schools of western europe till the tenth century but there is little in them of real value and after his death in 636 no great man of learning appears in western europe till the coming of alcuin 
while however the study of the great writers of the ancient world decayed on the continent it began in ireland where the coming of christianity was accompanied by a great literary revival the irish or scots as they were called by contemporary chroniclers became not only messengers of christianity but also of culture till the norse invasions of the eighth century ireland remained a home of literature and of students from ireland the lamp of learning was passed on to the neighbouring island england also received educational stimulus from another source for theodore of tarsus sent from rome to organise the church in england brought with him hadrian abbot of st peter's rome under whom a flourishing school began at canterbury under his influence an englishman benedict biscop founded a great library at wearmouth in northumbria where the influence of the northern missionaries was still strong at malmesbury also a scottish teacher Mailduff, set up a school which grew and flourished but it was at jarrow a daughter house of the monastery of wearmouth that english learning found its greatest representative in the scholar whom later ages have loved to call the venerable bede born in six seventy three bede spent his whole life at the monastery of jaro while attentive to the rules of my order and the service of the church my constant pleasure lay in learning teaching or writing bede had nothing of the hostility toward secular learning that we find in gregory the great and other church leaders on the continent he loved virgil and the other latin poets and was familiar with plato and aristotle his life was spent in teaching and writing crowds of students flocked to him and over forty works remained after his death to attest his literary activity on his death in seven thirty five the educational centre of england shifted to york where egbert the bishop afterwards archbishop developed the school that wilfred had founded northumbria remained the most important centre of learning in western europe till the danish invasions destroyed its prosperity and peace but before this the revival of learning had passed from northumbria to the court of charles the great the earliest men of learning to arrive at the frankish court were scots from ireland and they were followed by alcuin alcuin or albinus as he called himself was a northumbrian by birth and had been brought up in egbert's school at york where he became the favourite pupil of the archbishop ethelbert who succeeded egbert as headmaster of the school used alcuin on various confidential missions one of which brought him to the court of charles the great about the year seven seventy three on this occasion he was apparently sent on by charles to rome on some business in which he was concerned when ethelbert succeeded as archbishop alcuin became practically head of the school and on the retirement of the archbishop he was sent to rome for the pall for his successor eanbald on the way he met charles at parma and received a pressing invitation to return with him to francia he returned home to obtain leave of absence from the archbishop and then settled down in the dominions of charles which he never quitted again except for a short visit of two years to northumbria from seven ninety one to seven ninety two at the frankish court he became head of the palace school and practically minister of education the palace school originally established in the days of the merovingian kings for the education of the king's sons and the sons of the nobles of the court was developed by charles into a kind of court university of learned men whom he gathered from all parts he himself attended lectures with his sons and succeeded in learning latin and greek but charles also desired to extend education throughout his realm and in a famous capitulary of seven eighty seven he ordered the establishment of schools in connection with every monastery in his kingdom in the organization of these schools 
and in providing textbooks for them alcuin took a leading part he was endowed by the king with the revenues of the monastery of st lupus at troyes and bethlehem at ferrieres he also took a leading share in the theological controversies of the time it was the outbreak of the adoptionist heresy that brought him back from england in seven ninety two and at the council of frankfurt he was the leading champion of orthodoxy how large a share he had in the events that led to the coronation of charles in eight hundred we do not know but some expressions in his letters to the king suggest that the restoration of the imperial office in the west had been discussed between them after seven ninety two he settled at the great monastery of st martin at tours of which he became abbot and where he spent the rest of his life carrying on a constant correspondence with charles and other friends at the court the learned men of the court were apparently a merry crew they bandied jests and exchanged riddles and adopt for epistolary purposes the names of classical and biblical characters thus charles becomes david alcuin flaccus albinus angelbert homer and the king's daughters and friends appear similarly disguised the king himself entered with zest into the battle of wits and loved to perplex his learned men with conundrums several other scholars joined the court at about the same time as alcuin peter of pisa who had formerly taught at pavia came to francia about seven eighty already an old man and taught grammar there till his death some years later a more notable man reached aachen a little later in paul the deacon the historian of the lombards he came to the court to plead for his brother who had been imprisoned and his property confiscated for his share in some lombard rising he became a special favourite with the king and stayed at the court for a good many years finally retiring to monte cassino where he died another literary colleague of alcuin was einhardt or Egenhardt, who was educated at the monastery of fulda and came to the frankish court as a young man he became a close friend of the king who employed him in various important public works his skill in all manner of metalwork earned him the nickname in the court circle of bezalel about the year eight twenty six he and his wife parted to enter religious houses and einhardt retired to the monastery of seligenstadt where he died about eight forty part of einhardt's work appears to have been superintending the compilation of the official annals of the reign but the literary work by which he is now chiefly remembered is his life of charles the great the de vita caroli magni is modelled on suetonius's life of augustus and is of course warmly eulogistic but there is no reason to doubt the substantial accuracy of the picture presented to us of the king and his court as einhardt knew both from personal experience though the ultimate aim of the education given in the palace and monastic schools was the study of theology alcuin did not discourage the liberal arts and the attitude of the roman authorities toward these grew more favourable but toward the end of his life alcuin seems to have felt some fear lest the study of classical literature might take too prominent a place in the educational system one of the most important services that charles and alcuin did for sound learning was the collecting and copying of the texts of the classical authors many of these had been copied and recopied by ignorant clerks till they had become almost unintelligible the texts were now revised by competent scholars and then copied in the scriptoria of the monasteries in the beautiful roman characters that now superseded the clumsy uncial letters the text of the holy scriptures and the service books of the church were also carefully revised and in the last year of charles's life we read of him as correcting with the assistance of certain learned greeks and syrians the four gospels of jesus christ strenuous efforts were made to encourage sound learning in the monasteries and cathedral schools in a letter to the archbishop of mainz charles writes you are striving by god's help to conquer souls and yet you are not anxious to instruct your clergy in letters at which i cannot be too astonished 
you see on all sides those who have submitted to your rule plunged in the darkness of ignorance and you leave them in their blindness in a kind of imperial rescript addressed to the bishops and abbots of his realm he says we have thought fit that in all bishoprics and monasteries entrusted by christ's grace to our government care should be taken not only to live regularly and in conformity with holy religion but also to study letters seriously and to teach and to learn each man according to his ability and by the help of god so that the religious rule of life which brings with it honourable conduct and zeal for teaching and learning may give regularity and beauty to language efforts were also made to improve the services of the church and in seven eighty six charles brought singers from italy to metz and soissons where they taught the gregorian method of chanting to frankish clerks one important result of this literary energy was to restore latin which was deteriorating in northern europe into an almost unintelligible jargon once more to the level of a literary language the latin prose and verse of angobert and alcuin is often crude and ungrammatical but it is an immense improvement on the scanty fragments that we have left from the previous period though the mass of the layman remained unaffected by this literary revival and could generally neither read nor write the standard of the education of the clergy was undoubtedly raised and never again sank as low as it had done in the seventh and eighth centuries the monastic schools established at this time went on through the dark century that followed and though the confusion and contests of the time precluded further progress the ground won through the efforts of charles and his literary helpers was never actually lost only one thinker of the first rank bridges the gulf that separates alcuin from the renaissance of the eleventh century john scotus erigena was born just at the time of alcuin's death he was apparently a native of ireland but of the details of his life very little is known all that is certain is that he came to the court of charles the bald about the year eight forty seven and remained for some years at paris where he is said to have presided over the school paris was at this time rising into importance as a political and literary centre partly through its nearness to the great monastery and church of st denis which was the burial place of the west frankish kings one of john's earliest tasks was to translate into latin a greek treatise supposed to have been written by dionysius the areopagite the st denis who was associated in legend with the first preaching of the gospel in gaul mr poole calls john the last representative of the greek spirit in the west his writings of which the most important is a philosophical dialogue called de de visione naturae show a speculative mind bold even to rashness and little disposed to accept the dogma of authority his opinions were pronounced heterodox even in his lifetime and after his death his name became the battle cry of theological contest he has been described as the founder of medieval scholasticism but it would probably be more correct to regard scholasticism as a reaction from his dangerous speculative activity he is said in later traditions to have lived on terms of close relationship with charles the bald much as alcuin had done with his great predecessor and to have returned to england after the death of his patron in eight seventy seven according to one legend he became head of the school at malmesbury and was murdered by his scholars but it is much more likely that he died in france soon after eight seventy seven hincmar of reims though primarily an ecclesiastical statesman and administrator ought perhaps to find a place besides john scotus in the records of the ninth century born in eight hundred and six he became a favourite adviser of louis the pious and on his death was taken into favour by charles the bald who appointed him in eight forty four as archbishop of the great see of reims for nearly forty years hincmar ruled as primate of the church in west francia the adviser and friend of a series of carolingian monarchs 
with whom he corresponded on familiar terms he was jealous in maintaining the rights of his order and did a great deal to strengthen the position of the church in west francia in the literary world he is chiefly known as the author of two treatises on predestination written in connection with a controversy in which he became involved with a monk called gottschalk who was supported by the archbishop of lyon the ecclesiastical head of southern gaul john scotus had already at hincmar's request endeavoured to controvert the heresies of gottschalk but in the opinion of the orthodox had promulgated more heresies than he disproved hincmar died in december eight eighty two at epernay whither he had fled from a norse attack on reims End of chapter twenty